Today I have the pleasure of welcoming Peter Martin from Dieten to this lecture about social conversation, where we, we will talk about how social conversation can enhance the health of both communities and our health workforce. Peter Martin is a professor of clinical communication and end of life here, and the extensive knowledge Peter has in this field derived from 25 years of experience with communication skills training to a variety of health professional disciplines from the experience as the palliative medicine physician and last but not least as director of center for organizational change in person center health care uh, at the faculty of health at the university uh, and there he has initiated a, a major invention Intervention by developing and running courses for health professionals, uh, including several training training courses. It's a course called uh, Resource, uh, Your Source Matter. And Peter Martin has been affiliated with the University of South Denmark and our Center for Research in Patient Communication since 2017 as a young professional. And it has given us the possibility uh, of uh, collaborating with Peter on our shared interest in communication skill training and especially in the uh, implementation and evaluation of training in multiple settings in clinical practice at hospital level. So, welcome, Peter. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation and uh, the work is your. Thanks, Sheena. Lovely to see you also. I can see a scattering of faces that I recognise, and it's lovely to be with you on this um, crisp autumn evening as it is here in Australia. I mean, I'm out in a hotel in the middle of the countryside, so uh, hopefully we'll have no technical issues. So I'll just call up my presentation, and I really look forward to your thoughts and questions, and I would encourage you to be all as provocative as you feel depending on many coffees you've had already in the day and, and to kind of create some interesting conversation. Um, so I'll just call up my presentation. So it's a great honor to be with you. I really valued um, my collaboration with my colleagues and yourselves and, and Denmark. And I hope um, that when all things COVID settle down a bit that I uh, look forward to coming back and I hope we can also return the hospitality of having our Danish colleagues um, back over in Australia. I'll talk about why our School of Medicine and Faculty of Health actually uh, created a new uh, professor or chair and why they created this new centre, which has got this very long name, which I'll try and explain. And what I'm hoping to do is to get us thinking about the place of conversations or skill consultations in the health, both of our community, those we serve, and actually for ourselves, our workforce. And I mean all of our workforce. I mean our, our laundry staff, our cleaning staff, but also clearly our health professionals. That's my Twitter handle there for those that tweet, and our center's Twitter handle where we promote courses and put up articles, etc. So, as I said, thinking about our community, our clinicians, and of course, our health system, because I don't know what it's like in Denmark, but our health system's under enormous pressure. And how can we help that? How can we build capacity to have these healthier conversations in what is already a very stretched health system to think about some specific context and consideration? And lastly, if we do embed skill conversation what do we actually see what do we see as a result of doing that and making that investment so i'm just gonna first of all i just want to remind us that we've got close to 50 years of evidence of health outcomes that are related to how we talk to people both our patients our families and increasingly I think very good and important evidence about how we talk to each other as professionals. So on the disease side, you know, getting the diagnosis right. And in fact, here in Victoria, 
the company that indemnifies or provides the, the litigation, if you like, has discovered that in particular in emergency departments, there's one of the biggest causes of getting a catastrophic wrong diagnosis is this idea of premature closure or confirmation bias. And that's that idea of the, the first thing you hear from another colleague is what we follow. We don't go back and check. I'm gonna talk about trust and what that means to people actually uh, adhering to their treatment or adhering to their lifestyle modification. I know locally there, you've done some fantastic work about how to help people recall and understand things about their illness, their prognosis and their treatment. Of course, all the time, increasingly, as our population ages, a lot of the illnesses we're dealing with are lifestyle related, and yet we know this is a real challenge. Then there's uh, actual disease outcomes, you know, particularly diabetes and others that have been studied. And for us in Australia, there's been a very big focus on major adverse events. These were things where things go terribly wrong, right through the, from severe morbidity right through to mortality. And we know about a quarter of those events are related not to processes, but how we talk to each other. And of course, on the patients, on the family side, we know they want to be treated as an individual. They don't want to feel rushed, yet we know they know that we need to be efficient as clinicians. And I think one of the biggest changes is that people really want to be involved in deciding their care much more than previously. Right across the world, and even in cultures that were much more deferential to the health professional, that's changing. If you look at the data coming out of Korea and Japan, countries before where this was not the case. And this idea of non-beneficial treatment, I think futility got a little maybe sidetracked in ethics, but this idea of treatment that is of no benefit to the, the individual or the family. I'm sorry about the acronym, that's end of life care um, and the choices we make around that with our aging population. And of course, how they adjust to having a new disease or illness, their psychological well-being. I've put this up. I don't know if this person got much coverage in your country, but this is ironically an Irishman like myself, a guy called Mike Ryan on the World Health Organization, you know, who's um, covered a lot in the mass media during COVID. And what I want to say here is that even in this, this idea that trust is an inherent part of what we do in health, to have a healthy conversation. And actually, I think it's very difficult for a society to thrive without trust. Okay, and then of course, you can look back at some of the original, you know, that these, these are quite a, old studies that you can see from the 90s, where there's a huge correlation between um, the term they used then, compliance, which has been probably superseded by adherence, but about half of it is how you trust your clinician, whether you will actually take the treatment or the management as directed. And just to say some emerging things, of course, person-centered healthcare. Increasingly, as people transition across different parts of our system, but particularly as they leave our acute hospital systems, there are some real issues about uh, conversations. Shared decision-making, I've mentioned. End of life care. Uh, uh, because of time constraints, I'm not going to detail, but what we have discovered on our own hospital system is if you look at using simple tools, about a third of all people in hospital have a life-limiting illness. And if you look at what happens them over the next three years, a third are dead within a year, and almost three quarters of them are dead within three years. So even though we look at it as acute care, the reality is if you have a longer lens, it's actually about end-of-life care. For us as well, I think our systems, our health systems were predominantly focused around single illnesses. And of course, what we've discovered now is that our patients are coming in, have multiple illnesses. They've got a high comorbid index or, uh, and, and then we're even seeing things where we're still actually fully understanding constructs such as frailty. And in fact, we have done some work with New South Wales um, with, they've got a frailty network because it's become such a big issue. And we've also got some data that those frail elderly do really bad in our acute health system. They stay in the emergency department longer. Nobody wants to kind of look after them. So there's some real issues about some kind of clinical constructs. Uh, I'm not going to talk about overdiagnosis, 
and you know the places of things like screening etc but that's obviously a big theme as well as we have more and more tests just uh, the, kind of just a, a little bit lighthearted, you know this idea of what our community want and what they tell us consistently right around the world is to feel heard for us to truly listen to them and so you know, i'm just using this quote as an example you know that how hard it is particularly as we acquire knowledge and skills and expertise and i think our colleague in the us ronald epstein said hold your expertise lightly in other words tap into it but you know first of all fundamentally this is relationship forming a relationship with another person whether they be a patient a carer or a colleague I just want to say um, I still work one day a week uh, as a, a kind of cancer clinician and my particular focus is on cancer weight loss or cancer cachexia. Um, we've looked at the carer's perspective of this, but one of the, this middle article here, which we've just uh, published, showed very big changes in quality of life and symptom benefit that we actually have not seen in this kind of uh, cohort before. And actually it's a multidisciplinary team. We've got a nurse, a physiotherapist, a dietitian and myself. And um, my hypothesis is, in fact, it's the quality of the conversations may have a big impact, but how we prove that is quite tricky. Other community perspectives. Well, here's a multinational study, 4,000 patients, 10 countries, including Australia. And I guess the big message out of this from the community lens is that still people don't feel, it's only a couple of years old, they don't feel involved in their decisions, in this case, cancer, okay, and particularly around the time of diagnosis. The real concern that our community are still feeling that they get on this kind of roller coaster uh, once they get a, a, a diagnosis, and yet they seem to feel disempowered to have their voice. This is our Irish colleagues who have done a big intervention, have done some amazing work and got some great resources which they're very generous in sharing. But even after they've done this, they're, they're still recognizing that there's issues they still need to improve. Patients still feel that they're not given an opportunity to discuss worries and fears. They feel rushed. And yet it's probably not the time with the clinician, in this case, the doctor they're mentioning, it's that sense of feeling rushed and that they don't get to discuss what they want. Okay, And yet again, not always involved in key decisions in their own health. I just want to put something a bit shocking here. This is a colleague whose literature I'm about to quote. Uh, Marie Bismarck uh, started off life as a lawyer and is now training actually as a psychiatrist. And she did some fasting work, but she posted this on Twitter, is that this is a very um, famous lady who discovered that too uh, high uh, concentration of oxygen made neonates blind, but her work was ignored for a very long time. And 20 years went past with lots of blind kids uh, who were given too much oxygen as neonates. And, the, and I want to really talk here about this evidence practice gap. And what I want to say is that we know a lot of the evidence and communication skills training has been around for 20 to 40 years, but it's, we're really struggling to how do we embed this and close that theory practice or evidence practice gap. My next graphic, you can see all these tools on the left, and I don't know about in Denmark, but in Australia, a lot of hospitals love a tool because they can deploy it quite easily as a project, put posters up. But of course, behavior change is much more complicated. And I think whilst there's some great tools out there and great mnemonics, it's the skill acquisition to be able to use it. And if you look at this kind of, you know, if it's a carpenter, there's no point having all the tools if you don't have the requisite skills. And to me, calm skills is the enabling skill that allows us to do everything else. I mean, uh, it's interesting, they used to be labeled soft skills. And I think it's a core enabling skill for everything we do, how we talk to our colleagues, how we obtain consent, how we do shared decision making, et cetera. So a little bit just about our center. First of all, our school really recognized that this was a major human capability that we wanted our graduates um, to have and also how we'd work that across the other health professions that we train. But they also recognized that we really wanted to focus on getting it into health organizations. 
and that's why they created this center. And, and, and the whole, if you like, vision was to create this cultural transformation. And I'm gonna come talk about that later from another context. And so we, uh, you can see here, you know, we offer a whole lot of different courses that people can uh, either join individually or that organizations commission us uh, to do and train. So whether it's with nephrology or we've done a lot of work with um, high risk surgery with anesthetists and surgeons, a whole range of issues. And this is the intervention that Yetta mentioned, Your Thoughts Matter, that we're uh, just running two, big, uh, two hospitals. We're hoping to go to a, a much larger uh, central hospital. But the idea is to create this two-pronged approach to changing conversations, to have healthy conversations. And what I want to say is that what we really wanted to show is that rather than just do one side, empower the, our community, or educate the workforce. We wanted to do both because we felt there'd be a synergy in doing that. And so there are some kind of core modules. There are people who are trained to then continually run those modules, but also that what we wanted to create the culture is that each and every time somebody from the community interacted with a clinician, they would feel empowered or more confident to ask questions and say what's on their mind. And so the idea of, you know, this, your thoughts matter. And there's a whole kind of different, there's a what matters kind of group. There's what matters now. There's all sorts of spin offs in this, but I think we're all trying to do the same thing empower the person to talk. And of course, there's particular cohorts that the research show this is even more important. People with less health literacy who are socially uh, disadvantaged, who may come from different cultural or ethnic backgrounds. This become they are still really worried at speaking up or looking or being made to look silly. And so, for instance, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just go past this. Um, so that was a picture of the question prompt sheet that where people would be able to fill it out and tick different bits. I'm sorry, there was some audio that embedded there that I wasn't aware of. Um, that. Uh, they could present to their physiotherapist, their nurse, their doctor, whoever, and help say, this is what I'm worried about. These are the questions I have, and so really empower them. So I think trying to integrate community empowerment, decisions aids, there's some, so many good decision aids, but they're rarely used. How we embed that in shared decision-making acquire skills for our workforce and of course do it at scale, which I'm going to get to and create this cultural change. And of course, Yeta and I and others have tried to say, what can we learn together by when we've done it at scale? And what, you know, and there's some real key things that most of these programs try to do, um, how you build it to be sustainable, how you do it at scale. Of course, the real challenge is getting the funding for it and sustaining it. Now, I just want to talk about complaints, and I, I hope uh, this uh, expression translates um, uh, the, the canary in the coal mine, in other words. I think this is a real symptom of things that are happening in our health system. And this quote from uh, the African-American poet Maya Angelou is that people will forget what you said or what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Or Mark Twain's quote, uh, you're really focusing on the non verbal is that you know kindness is a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see that there's something innate about how we care for people now i'm sorry this is such a crude diagram but this is actually a quarterly report of of complaints come to a big metro hospital that we did some work with here and um, what i've tried to highlight of all the complaints they received, and I know um, Yetta and colleagues have done some interesting work on in this as well, the vast majority actually out, were outnumbered by things related to how we communicate or what our healthy conversations look like. Courtesy, coordination, um, discharge information, discussion of worries. You can see it all there, opportunity to talk to the clinicians and things like respect and dignity. So I think complaints are a huge part. Um, I think things like patient-related outcomes and experiences are going to be one of the big drivers of change in healthcare. 
us them telling us what's important and, me, and what to be measured. So just a, a big jump for those that um, my colleagues and, and um, that know me well know I love my food and fine dining. And this is a fascinating study from Imperial College London of what we can learn from a, a high Michelin star restaurant. And I guess what I took from it is that this idea that to get a, you know, three Michelin stars, you have to have incredible quality and consistency. It's quality every time. And when they looked at the healthcare communication aspects, the themes that were across both a, a high-end restaurant and health were this idea of kind of tailored information without bombarding people. That they're able to kind of create the sense while serving a purpose and creating a task, that it was a conversation, not an interrogation. And lastly, they met you as an individual being met as a person. So it's really interesting just stepping right outside of health and thinking, what else can we learn from other sectors? Just want to do this uh, quickly. On the side of complaints, what we know is that I think we're setting up people who struggle with this for failure, that we're not setting them up to succeed. So what we know, this is Marie's work that I mentioned before, is that in Australia anyway, it's a, a disproportionately small number of clinicians who create a vast majority. So you can see 3% of them accounted for nearly half of all complaints and just 1% of them a quarter of all complaints. And I think, you know, are we really supporting these individuals who are struggling? Um, and of course, uh, uh, the impact that they're having on our community. And what I want to say in this article, this is another article from, from Marie, is that if you've had two or three complaints about your communication, the reality is you've got a very high risk of much more. So what are we doing to support those individuals? You know, you can imagine if they were having problems with other health outcomes, like a procedural outcome, that we'd give them a lot of professional development, but we don't, not typically in healthcare communication. Okay, and just to you know, say something really obvious, we know that this is much more likely to be men of a certain age from certain specialties than women, certainly in Australia. There's some other work around the world that's similar. Uh, and there's obviously people have looked about why that might be. But on the flip side, what happens to us? Well, there's a few angles to look at this. The reality is if, you're, if we have been subject to a complaint that it really has a big impact, and I look for predominantly here at doctors, but I think this uh, here in Australia, things like paramedics and nursing, it's changing as well. So it has a significant mental health impact. And it seems to be the, the mental health impact is dependent where the, the complaint goes to, whether it's local. And certainly the more it escalates, the higher it goes, the bigger the mental health impact goes, right up to severe anxiety and depression. This is from a UK study. Okay, and this is a study I was involved with some um, uh, Italian colleagues. And what was really interesting here, even though the methodology, uh, you know, uh, we need to do it again with more rigor, is that if the clinicians felt confident and equipped regarding communication, to how to have a healthy conversation, and then you looked at the correlate of one of these burnout inventories, and particularly, you know, just even focusing on how they feel equipped to have something like a bad news conversation or a prognostic discussion, just feeling confident protected you from aspects of burnout. And I think, I don't know what it's like in Denmark, but certainly here in Australia, this, this is becoming a bigger issue. And of course, what we know is that clinicians who are highly more highly rated in burnout don't give us effective care. So it's bad for them and it's bad for the health system and, and for our community. So I just wanna challenge some big things here. So some of the provocative statements I mentioned. There are some big work, workforce assumptions that there's a kind of competency that we could uh, as, assume with our workforce, that people improve as they get more senior, as you might expect, um, people would expect that with some other kind of technical or procedural um, uh, seniority, 
that when people move into new roles, whether that's a, as a, a, a nurse in charge of a ward or in charge of a department, that they would just get the new skills. But of course, the, the changing nature or of our workforce or so nurse practitioners, for instance, here in Australia, have become a much um, bigger and more important part of our workforce. Okay, and that of course they are such they underpin us being effective and efficient because time is a major issue for us all. And of course, as you acquire these skills, you can transfer them from one context to another. All right. This is a really interesting. This is psychophysiology. And what I kind of want to got out of this is that they looked at things like breaking bad news and looked at the physiological impact on, on the clinicians. They measured heart rate, heart rate variation, blood pressure, the conductance of your skin, you know, what did it make you feel sweaty and stressed? And they even looked at things like you know, cortisol levels and natural killer cells. And of course, not surprisingly, we know physiologically these really complex conversations are stressful. And I think to make them healthy, we need to really, like every other complex procedure or skill, we need to help people feel equipped so that they're not as stressful. This is a slide from my colleagues um, in the US uh, from Vital Talk, which is a, a group really um, uh, focusing on, on on a type of uh, uh, calm skills training. And I guess all I want to say here is, you know, the, whether you agree with these rankings, but top US hospitals want to be associated with high quality, healthy conversations. You know, they're ranking here that 19 of the top 20 hospitals in the US have significantly invested because they think it's so important for quality care and safety. And if you look at what they have done in terms of capacity building with this kind of train the trainer model, they've actually, now they've been going quite a long time. They've uh, taught 20,000 clinicians. Okay, and you can see that kind of exponential growth, you know, and, and they've done it through particularly this focus on mastering tough conversations and that they've got this faculty or trainers, they've got about nearly 650 trainers. And what I really wanted to kind of focus us on for the workforce is, are we truly setting our workforce up for success? Or are we actually setting up to fail, having increasingly complex conversations with huge outcomes in a stress system, but not giving them the, the skills and sometimes the tools and the professional development to do the job we're asking of them. And I think we are setting up to fail. Uh, um, with some exceptions like the work Yetta and colleagues are doing, um, that needs to change because it has an impact on them, has an impact in our community, and I want to get to the impact on our health system. Now, I'm sorry about this terrible uh, graphic of a helix, um, but what I really wanted to convey here is that what we're really trying to do is just help each person improve by one step. And I also want to challenge us that sometimes we need to be thoughtful is it may not be as important what the step is, but the fact that they one step at a time, they're improving, they're moving up this helix of skill and efficiency and effectiveness. So just moving on. So one of our kind of mantras when we're doing training is just one thing, just one skill that you do want to try and master them all at once. But for instance, just mastering a formative summary as a structuring skill to help people follow your consultation is a big improvement. It's not five or six things, it's just one thing. Another jump, this idea of how we might move the healthy conversation and seeing it and seeing strong emotions, things like fear, sadness, and anger as data. And this is this really interesting article out of the literature for palliative care where I come from. But the, what they did was they looked at the, the, the emotional state and then actually found out what the, the under the driver was. And what was interesting is when they looked at fear, it was generally about the fear about the prognostic discussion. And if you look at the people who were angry, the thing they wanted most was to feel heard. And yet we know that's such an important thing of actually 
resolving the anger. And we know that from functional MRI work that people cannot do complex cognitive tasks when they're emotionally aroused. They, they literally, it impacts on their cognitive capacity. So yet we don't attend to their emotion, ask them to do complex cognitive tasks and understand conversations without addressing their emotional state to take them back where they can have these complex conversations. Here's another recent um, um, paper that I've just discovered, sorry, it's a few years old now. And this idea, you know, that I think there's been a lot of debate about empathy. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, author wrote about the notion of clinical empathy, because in fact, if you study anaesthetists, for instance, they very quickly lose their empathy about putting needles in people. And of course you think, well, of course they need to, because otherwise that would be a terrible thing if they act. For most of us, when we say needle going to somebody, we have a, a hardwired neurological response. It's part of our neurobiology. But the neuroplasticity means you can change that. And so this construct of clinical empathy is what you need to maintain and almost what you need to detach. And of course, a long time ago, you know, this idea that um, uh, physicians, and this was again the end of doctors, where you'd be detached from this terrible word of imperturbable. In other words, nothing would upset you. Whereas, of course, that's not what we want in our clinicians. Um, and I think this idea and this, this author that really struck me with is moving to a really engaged curiosity, being truly curious about what's going on for the patient and their family and their life. And I think that to me, that's more you know, this clinical empathy, what, what our role is as clinicians. Coming on to nursing and allied health. Um, as I said, I'm not as familiar with uh, the, the Denmark, but here in Australia, there is no doubt the world is changing and that as nurses scope of practice and as allied health become much more leadership team rules, that I think they're our biggest untapped resource in terms of changing the nature of, health, of conversations. And of course, the literature is emerging that, you know, looking much more about what is happening uh, from uh, a kind of perspective of nurses and allied health. And you know, a local study that I did with some colleagues and I can see um, I've been involved with, uh, and you can see some of your colleagues involved here as well, is that they also are worried that they feel unskilled for things like family complexity you know, organizational impacts in patients, family, end of life conversation. And of course, challenging talking with us horrible doctors that, you know, this team communication, which we'll get onto. But if you do give them professional development, they feel much more able to have really important conversations. So that's the acronym goals of care conversations about what's important for the person so we can actually shape their care. That senior nurses, of course, can do this but, um, but they're much more likely to do it with professional development. Just going to focus on uh, uh, end of life, baking bad news uh, as an example. And I guess what I want to see, um, of, sorry, is that there are core skills that we can teach because we know that, for instance, that a lot of people, even with an advanced cancer, have prognostic discordance. That is, they don't realize how sick they are and therefore they make decisions based off imperfect data. And again, if you look at this study um, in the, the US, um, that's particularly for certain cohorts of our community, those less educated and from certain cultural backgrounds. Patients bring this up, but it requires us to be skilled to do it. So often if you say at the start, we've got 20 minutes together, this is what I'd like to cover. What would you like to cover? And what if you pause at that point, often they will hint to you that they want to talk about the future. And this is from uh, you know, Ruth Parry and colleagues at Loughborough. And what I want to say is what happens if we do that? What if we have a healthy conversation? even as something as a motive as end of life care, where first of all, we know less than one in 20 had one of those conversations with anybody before coming into hospital. It's a, a great study in the US. 
a lot of clinicians are concerned that will distress people, but community uh, members tell us that if it's done with compassion, it doesn't distress them. And yet if we do, they tend to get the care they want, they leave hospital quicker, and they don't come back to the hospital for an unplanned readmission. So it's kind of a big impact on our health system. Lots of people have looked at what they, how patients think about these two conversations, and they have remarkably similar uh, ideas and domains, if you like, comfort, dignity, wanting honest conversations. They do want hope in that, even if you need to reframe that hope. And of course, their family and relationships are key. So they want to talk about their hopes and wishes. Though interestingly, they didn't seem to explore feeling safe enough to, dis to discuss their fears. All right. So money, and this has been one of my concerns for our sector in health communication research, is that we're really competing for precious, um, you know, dollars here in Australia. And that if we can show that invest in, in this helps. So what we know is that if you can establish people's goals of care, what's important to them, it costs less. And in fact, there's some fascinating studies about why doctors consume much less health care when they've got a life limiting illness than our general community. Here's another study on the right. Uh, people are concerned that if you have those conversations, it will take longer. But in fact, here's a study in the US where they actually it did not have a, an impact on time efficiency. So you can still have these big conversations without losing productivity, if you like. This was from the plenary that I, some, uh, that my, I know my colleagues, some of them saw that. But what's fascinating about this is that if you understand the context of a person's life, their cultural, spiritual beliefs, their health behavior, their relationships, their social support. And if you do that, it actually changes decisions, it changes the impact. And yet we know, and you can see here these figures, like 40%, it's overlooked. They're more likely to have harmful care. They're more likely to have expensive care. And people who do this well understand people with context life don't take longer consultation and we get better with training. And I mentioned, again, if you don't understand this, they're much more likely to end up with very um, burdensome or non-beneficial treatment in the last days of their life. And yet we know skills like being able to discuss a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, can provide hope for the best scenario, but help people discuss how they might plan around the worst case scenario. And you can use skills like a hypothetical question. If you were to get a pneumonia, as a result of your chemotherapy in two weeks, can we discuss what that would look like for you, how you would feel about it, what would be important? And so there are groups around the world really looking at this as just one example. Quickly gonna cover non-technical skills. And in fairness to surgery, they have really done some fascinating work on this. And the punchline from this first study is that when you just look at the tone of somebody's voice and remove the words, that we know people who have a domineering tone, this is well in the US at least, seem to be have especially a high risk of being sued. And yet there's an, also a risk with uh, litigation and being sued with poor outcomes for the patients. So how you think about the tone of your voice matters. Those nonverbal skills matter a lot. And yet, if you get the patients and they look at patients' rating of surgeons prior, um, that there's lots of night literature showing that it predicts surgical comp uh, complications. So it's not just they say, I'm technically strong, the patient experience is less important. Now there's an association with the patient experience of how you talk to them and their surgical complications. And that's particularly true for major surgery. This is a fascinating study where they had a simulated operative crisis, in this case, a major hemorrhage. And they randomized 
the surgeon to be polite or rude or incivil, I think is really good. And you can see here at the top, there's a 30% drop in performance. And I think what's really also very interesting is that the anesthetists whose performance dropped when the surgeon was rude were not aware that when they were measured against the gold standard way to respond to major hemorrhage, they, they were not aware that their, um, their behavior was impacted by the surgeon. Here's another interesting study that our tasks performance uh, changes with people being rude to us. But it also seems to be that the more empathic you are, the more impacted you are by rude behavior. And so this kind of maladaptive thing of losing your empathy when you're exposed to consistent incivil or rude behavior. And here's a lovely study of just changing something really simple like the type of mask you're wearing during COVID. The patients clearly preferred clear masks. They understood their clinicians better. They felt more empathic and they trusted them more back to that big concept of trust. But interesting, the surgeons didn't want to change, or at least half of them didn't want to change. Really interesting about you know, behavior change. So I just want to kind of wrap up and talk about my kind of big summary of this literature. There's good evidence about patient satisfaction in healthy conversations. And uh, um, telehealth, which I didn't even get to, by the way, has been the biggest change in health ever. And I think we need to think about all the technical changes in that. And I just want to close up by saying is that changing the culture of our conversations as well as our knowledge as well as our technical skills is a major departure. And I kind of feel hard to change that direction. But I think if we did, we'll have clinicians that feel more confident and competent, less stressed, more engaged, and with better relationship with their colleagues and teams. That our health system will be providing less non-beneficial treatment, particularly for those with life-limiting illness. They're more likely to take the treatment that's recommended and have better health outcomes. And they're better to have quality and safe care. And lastly, and most importantly for our community, they'll continue to feel like an individual and not just a diagnostic label. They'll feel that they get more compassionate care. They'll trust their health professionals more, feel less rushed. And lastly, I think one of the big growth there is more empowered to take a major role in their own health care. And of course, this big idea of adherence and trust I want to come back to, it's such a huge issue. So I'll stop there and take some questions. There's our organizational email, my personal email, and um, our, our Twitter handle. So I'm going to stop. I'll, st I'll stop sharing the screen in a minute and see, hopefully I've left some time for some questions. Thank you very much for your attention.